The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. I'm Andrew Capehart, lead staff person for the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, or the APS TARC, here at WRMA. I'll be moderating the webinar today. Uh, we're going to be hearing about increasing knowledge of APS through national data and evaluation, and I will introduce our speakers in just a moment. Uh, next slide. A quick disclaimer about today's webinar, uh, the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System and the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated, and the contractor's findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the federal government's official policy. Um, next slide. I'd like to tell you just a tiny bit about our APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, uh, or the TARC. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we possibly can. Just reach out to us at any time if there's something that we can help you with. There'll be some contact information uh, displayed at the end of the webinar for how you can reach out to us if you'd like to. Uh, next slide. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this session is being recorded and it will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify all the webinar registrants via email when it's posted online on the YouTube channel for ACL. Uh, you may use your telephone or your computer to connect to audio. Just select the option you prefer on your GoToWebinar control panel. An example is displayed here where you can make your selection. Uh, all participants in this webinar are muted for the duration, so there's no need to mute your line manually. Next slide. If you have any questions of our presenters, you can simply type them in the questions box. Uh, an example of where to type is posted on this slide and it's circled in purple. You don't have to wait until we pause for questions to submit yours. We'll pause at the end of the presentation, but you can type your questions at any time as we move along and uh, we'll get to them in uh, succession when it's time to take questions. Next slide. I'll take a brief moment to introduce today's speakers. Um, Stephanie whittier Lyson is the team lead for the Office of Elder Justice and APS at the Administration for Community Living uh, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Carl Urban is my coworker here at the APS TARC, and he's a senior research manager. And then we also have Dr. Zach Gassamies, a researcher and assistant professor of family medicine and gerontology at the University of Southern California. And so now um, I will turn things over to Stephanie to make some remarks. If you can go to the next slide. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good morning for some, I think. No, it's three o'clock. It's afternoon for everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie, as Andy introduced me. I'm with the Administration for Community Living. Um, I'm going to share a little bit today about ACL's vision and mission to improve adult protective services. Um, we'll also do an overview of the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System and the uh, process evaluation that we've begun for adult protective services. We're also going to talk about new knowledge from NAMERS and the APS evaluation. Um, we're going to go through this rather quickly. This is the same presentation for those of you who might have been at the NAPSA conference, the National Adult Protective Services Association conference this year, or if you were at the HCBS conference, or even some of you if you were at the Texas APS conference, um, this is the same data that you've seen before. Um, but if you have additional questions or anything that you'd like to chime in, please um, enter those in the chat box. And as Andy said, we'll get to those as we um, wrap up the presentation. Next slide, please. Oh. Can we move to the next? Okay, I'm not seeing, okay, here we go. So ACL's vision and mission to improve APS um, is this next section, next slide. I think I'm having some delays. Yeah, it looks like there's a few delays for everybody. There, we there you go. go. Wonderful, thank you. So to kick us off, I want to set the context for 
not only the work that we're going to talk about today, but uh, all of the work that we engage in at the Administration for Community Living around that issue or the topic of elder justice. So all of the programs that we have, including our APS program, uh, programming, but also the legal services program, programming, long-term care ombudsman, our retirement security, um, that is all framed within the context that we are striving to help develop a comprehensive multidisciplinary system to support older adults and adults with disabilities uh, because we, we are broader than just the Older Americans Act, even though we're housed within the Administration on Aging. But our ultimate goal is that these individuals, all individuals can live where they choose, with whom they choose, and participate in the communities to the extent that they would like to without the threat of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Okay, next slide. I'm getting a lot of flashes, Andy. I don't know if that's everybody, but why yeah. I? No, I think, yeah, I think there is. Thanks. Uh, we'll see if we can. Okay. Sorry, all, but we're going to move right through it. So why did we undertake the projects that you're going to hear about today, as well as others that we're doing? This will not be a surprise to folks. We've seen wide variability across the country, as well as within states themselves with APS programming. We've had no national performance data, which NAMERS is not, but we haven't had any to understand how APS is doing. Um, we've had inconsistent state data. There's not been a national effort. Uh, we've had no comprehensive evaluation or on a national scale about state systems, what works, a theoretical framework for even understanding APS. Um, and because of all this, the efficacy and outcomes have been difficult for us to define and measure. So these were all the challenges that we were um, faced with in trying to figure out our, some of the solutions or activities towards those. Next slide, please. Yay. Okay, so here are a few of the projects that we've initiated to help address some of those challenges. We'll talk about the National Adult Mal Maltreatment Reporting System and NAMERS, the APSTA Resource Center. Many of you know about our National Voluntary Consensus Guidelines. Um, we're conducting two separate evaluations of adult protective services. One is a process evaluation, which you'll hear about today. The other one is an outcomes evaluation, which some of you might have heard about, but we'll be uh, coming out with more information soon. That one is not completed. We're just in the phase of doing the federal register notices um, for the survey instruments that we would like to use for that one. We're doing a tool, I mean, an inventory of tools that APS uses so that we can stop duplicating our efforts, that we can all benefit from great work that's been done in the field so far with risk tools, assessment tools. Um, we provide grants, discretionary grants to states for improving their systems statewide. And then we've also funded a number of innovation grants trying to move our knowledge base forward in understanding adult maltreatment, elder maltreatment, as well as effective interventions. Next slide, please. Okay. I was going to um, share with you a little bit about how the work of the APS TARC ties into everything, but Carl does such a fantastic job with it. I'm gonna turn this slide over to Carl <laughs> um, for him to explain. So the basic idea is that with all of the things that Stephanie was just talking about, we've got a number of, I, number of uh, things that we're working on that's all geared towards this idea of developing knowledge and trying to better understand what the evidence base is for adult protective services. And so you see um, in that first column there where we talk about data and evaluation that are geared towards doing that. So uh, we do that through the NAMERS project and the data that we've been collecting on that. And then we've been able to, with that NAMERS data, start doing some process evaluation work. So we're looking particularly, and Zach will give you a little bit more detail on this, understanding policy, understanding practice. We're gonna do a survey this year on, on APS practice. 
and then the whole idea of trying to look at outcomes and we have through our evaluation tried to define some outcomes knowledge is great but knowledge by itself doesn't really do as much good because what we're trying to do is to take that knowledge and then turn that into uh, ways to help APS programs do a better job. And so our mechanisms for doing that are through communication, uh, through increasing access to knowledge, um, and then through providing direct assistance uh, to you to provide assistance in helping you. And so I'm not going to go through every cell in this in this chart in this um, in this chart, but you can see the different ways that we're doing that through things such as social media, through toolkits that we'll be doing, uh, and and we also encourage you to reach out, as Andy says a minute ago, to reach out to us, uh, and we'll, we will try to reach out and answer your questions as we go along. Build the foundation, understand the evidence base, and then implement the tools and the process and the progress for improving what we're doing in APS. Next slide, please. I remembered. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carl, for handling that one. Um, next, we're going to move on to a brief, brief overview of NAMERS and um, the, the evaluation done um, to date. So next slide, please. Okay, I'm sure most of you on the call, if you're from APS, you know about NAMERS. The goal of NAMERS is to collect consistent and accurate national data on the abuse of older adults and adults with disabilities as it's reported to state adult protective service agencies. So again, we're talking a small number of, um, in, a smaller number than the whole population, but we have the potential to have a lot of information about maltreatment because of the interaction with adult protective services. Next slide, please. Here are some key things to remember about NAMERS. It is a completely voluntary system. The states are not required to report in any way, shape, or form, and they actually don't even receive um, a consistent funding stream to do the reporting or the data collection. It's 100% voluntary. Each state submits only one time, or one submission, excuse me, even states that gather information from multiple different um, sources or organizations such as a state that has both an adult protective and an elder protective service, it's still one submission. Um, the, the data that we get are cases closed in the prior federal fiscal year. So, for instance, we are in December of 2019. When states start submitting their data uh, for the prior year, they'll be submitting it for October 1, 2018 through September 30th of 2019. Our first year of submission was for the fiscal year 2016, so it was released in 17, and we have just released our 2018 report um, just a few weeks ago. In fact, it's on the ACL website. States report, all states report agency component data, so information about their administrative structure, um, what do they investigate, et cetera. Then they make a decision about whether they're going to submit either summary statistics, which we call case, uh, excuse me, key indicators, or they're, they'll send case component, case level data, um, the case level data we call case component. Next slide. So here are the attributes of the data in NAMERS. We have information on clients, which are reports that were open for an investigation, victims, which are substantiated allegations, the perpetrators, and then again, agency info. Next, please. So we've seen a huge increase in the participation in NAMERS. We're very excited about this. As you can see in 2016, we had two entities. There's 56 reporting jurisdictions. So we have our states, the District of Columbia, and all of the territories. So our N is 56. Uh, we had two that couldn't participate at all in our first year. And by the third year, we had all of the states and territories uh, participating in some way, shape, or form. We've seen an increase in um, states submitting agency and case components and 
obviously then a, de a subsequent decrease in those who are sending us um, only key indicators and again, those in only sending um, agency. But we still have gaps in the data. Uh, they aren't all sending the same information, the same data element. So we still have some, um, some places where we're missing information. And, and I think we'll get into that a little bit more as we go on through the presentation. Next slide. All right. So here I'm going to turn it over to Zach, who's going to walk us through our APS evaluation. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so I, as the dry academic, have the task of uh, walking you through the approach we took to the, uh, to the evaluation and kind of how we're thinking of evaluation in general as we've approached this project. Uh, so first, to give you a kind of um, framework for who's, the, who's at the table, uh, we have a team that was uh, put together by the, the team at WRMA. Uh, it paired up APS subject matter experts, and PhD researchers, uh, and a couple of us who have uh, a little bit of knowledge on both sides of the, of the framework. Um, on the APS administration side, we have, um, we have an administrator from a larger county run program, uh, as well as from a, uh, a, a county run, I'm sorry, a larger state run program, as well as from a county run program. So we kind of got a good range of perspectives there from the APS subject matter expert side, um, and also a, a range of perspectives from the evaluation and social science side um, in terms of the PhDs at the table. So we, we undertook a multi-phase plan that I'll go over in the next slide um, to really kind of lay out the framework for how APS works and get a bit more in-depth information into the various components of APS uh, through kind of starting from the ground up and really getting as much of the fund fundamental foundation as possible before moving upwards and trying to get a bit more into the weeds. Next slide, please. I just took the slides out of order. <laughs> um, I apologize. So let me actually, if we can go back to the last slide, um, and I'll actually go over what is on that slide, um, the perils of having parallel systems here. So the reason that we, that we undertook this evaluation effort was to really gain insight into various aspects of how APS worked um, and the, uh, the various aspects of the system. So this encompasses program improvements, looking at um, things that can change on the program to program level. No one program can really um, work on belly button gazing unless they have a sense of kind of the broader landscape of APS and APS programs. So that's a really important aspect of it. Another aspect is the initiative improvement aspect uh, in which we're really hoping to support other, other initiatives surrounding the improvement of APS um, in part through the voluntary consensus guidelines for APS systems, um, adding more information that can enhance the, the input going into the process of establishing voluntary consensus guidelines, uh, enhancing the neighbor system, et cetera, and then broader system improvements. So going beyond the individual state programs, going beyond the initiatives that are happening um, around the field, but really looking at bolstering the, the national APS system and um, really establishing a more fundamental uh, framework for APS that can be used in thinking about how APS functions nationally. Um, so at that point, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, this one's just laying out what I was talking about a second ago, the team that was at the table to help engage in these evaluation and, uh, evaluation activities. Uh, so I won't go over that again. Next slide, please. So here we are. The, the process that we undertook to go about evaluating APS um, really was looking at as I mentioned, a, a very um, kind of building block approach. Uh, so in terms of the research that we did, our first step was to delve in and look at APS state policies. Uh, that's component one. Um, really starting with looking at what's written, what's, what's kind of codified either in statute and regulation, et cetera. The second part of it was component two, looking a bit beyond the policies themselves, because we, all, we always know that 
policy doesn't necessarily align perfectly with practice. So we wanted to build on what we knew about policy from component one uh, to get a, a sense of what practices were on the ground by, by doing some research in component two. That was through conducting an online survey. Um, that survey is actually soon to be launched, uh, making its way through the federal approval process, and we're very excited to get that off the ground soon. Uh, and then component three, which is a majority of what we'll talk about here, which is really um, looking at the various uh, various characteristics of APS programs, uh, various metrics that tell us about uh, APS activities from state to state, and linking those up. So seeing how the metrics align with the characteristics. Next slide, please. So in order to to investigate all these things, we first needed the conceptual model that Stephanie uh, talked about as lacking initially. So to do that, we put together a very basic logic model. Um, when I say very basic, it is actually a, a very intricate logic model once we get into the nuts and bolts of it. But this is a basic overview of it. Um, so as logic model, models go, it, it uh, goes from the context and the inputs that are in place for APS systems to function, goes into the activities uh, that are engaged in by APS programs. Instead of using the typical outputs, that you see in many logic models, we decided to use activity metrics um, because these are really metrics by which to gauge and measure the activities that are being undertaken. And instead of using the outcomes language, we used expected results. So the results that are expected to result from the activities that APS is engaging in. Uh, throughout the last three of those items, we followed a, a stage process wherein we had activities, metrics, and expected results at each of these four levels, from intake to investigation, post-investigation services, and quality assurance. Uh, so we will be focusing on primarily the first three of those four uh, during this presentation. Next slide, please. In component three, which is again linking up APS characteristics with APS metrics, we took um, uh, another framework to looking at that, wherein we separated out what we called independent variables from dependent variables dependent variables being kind of the primary metrics we're looking at, and independent variables being the APS characteristics, um, some of which are metrics as well, but slightly different version of metrics that we wanted to uh, investigate. So those metrics are divided into three different categories, uh, looking at APS administration and structures, policies and practices related to reporting, and policies and practices related to investigation. And we'll go over um, all of these, I think, throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. I will zoom through these since Carl will be uh, talking about each, uh, each metric and characteristic in a bit more detail later on. Uh, but briefly, the dependent variables, the key metric that we were looking at were reports per 1,000 APS eligible adults in the state, the percentage of reports accepted for investigation in the state, the percentage of investigations that were then substantiated for maltreatment, and then finally the percentage of victims, so that's substantiated victims, who went on to receive services in the state. Uh, these four variables we looked at broken down by the independent variable uh, characteristics. Uh, next slide, and we can look over some of them. Uh, so first on the APS program characteristics, uh, we have these five. Um, Again, for the sake of time, I think I'll just skip through these, and you'll see them come up on Carl's slides as we go. So next slide, please. Uh, on the intake and investigation slide, uh, side, we had these two intake characteristics and these five investigation characteristics. And next slide, at which point I will turn it back over to Carl to uh, lead us through a bit more of a detailed look into these variables. I will pick up where um, Zach left off by talking just a little bit about um, one of the one of the real things that we've done to advance knowledge with with the work that we've been doing is to think about this framework um, that Zach just went through quickly, both in terms of the of the logic model as well as in terms of the framework with the dependent and independent variables. 
Um, basically, that kind of thought work had not been done before uh, in the world of APS when you're looking at state systems. Um, so the first thing I think we've done in, in terms of increasing knowledge is thinking about what is the structure, what is the framework for thinking about APS. Um, that's fairly significant because it gives us a framework for the types of analysis and the type of evaluation that we want to do in the future. Um, we, we mentioned a second ago that we anticipate this year we will be doing a survey on practice in APS, and so we're going to gather some new data with practice in APS, and, and we'll be able to think about, use these dependent variables that we came up with as a framework for looking at the data that we will gather through the practice analysis to try to understand um, what seems to be going on in APS that makes a difference. And so now I'm going to go through uh, very quickly um, some of the things that we have learned. I, I'm not going to take the time to explain them in a lot of depth. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can do a couple of things. Feel free to, to write the questions into the chat box or the question box as we go this afternoon, or just follow up um, with us later, and we will be glad to talk to you about some of the things that we have found. And so with that, um, here we go, next slide. So administrative summary. Um, I felt like needed to do a kind of a summary slide here for just understanding the administration of APS overall. Uh, you know, one of the things that became very clear to us as we worked on those policy profiles, not that this is really gonna surprise anybody, but man, it, that there is much diversity across the countries in terms of, of what is APS and how it actually works. It's, it's very diverse in terms of the organizational framework, the size of the programs really differ, uh, the simple scope of what is included in APS and is not included in APS in terms of the populations that are served is very different. Um, with that said, with that framework of diversity, we also see some high degree of consistency of some things. The types of maltreatment that are investigated are fairly consistent. Uh, there's usually some form of mandatory reporting across the states. Standard of evidence, as an example, is something that's pretty consistent across the state. Next slide, please. So, jumping into some of the things that we know specifically. Uh, most APS programs are located in Health and Human Services Agency, uh, as shown in blue here. Um, the rest of the programs are shown in red, and then we have a, a couple of others that um, are a little bit different or a little bit outliers. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the, dif the distinction between what's a state run and what is a county-based system. Um, as you can see, most States, 35 of them are state-run systems and 15 are county-run systems. Next slide, please. Um, so who do APS programs serve? And, and when we look at the data, we, it basically falls into four categories. There are APS programs that are elderly-only programs, three of those. There are APS programs that are elderly with a disability, that's two. Uh, there are APS programs in which everybody above a certain age and then 18 to whatever that older age is with a disability is served. But by far, the greatest program is, uh, the, the greatest category is adults with disabilities. And so if it's 18 and older and have a disability or vulnerability, whatever language a particular state use, that is by far the biggest category for APS programs. Next slide, please. Um, when we look at the, at the policy profiles in particular, um, we, we asked the question, how many APS programs serve or do investigations in residential facilities? And what we discovered was that in 38 states, APS investigate allegations of abuse, neglect, and exploitation of some type in residential facilities. We even went so far to try to categorize it or to break it down into some other patterns. And there's just such diversity across the states that we really had harder ways of coming up and breaking it down into different categories. Um, in 14 states, APS never investigates allegations of abuse, of abuse neglect, exploitation in a facility. 
uh, in four states, we couldn't really tell from the material that we were looking at what was going on. Next states. Um, APS programs generally are working to balance uh, the need for protection with client rights. And so there's two, a couple of different ways of looking at that. Many APS programs are guided by some sort of principles or values that talk about things such as self-determination and things that focus and value on the, on the rights um, of APS clients. And so a lot of programs are using NAPSA guiding, as their guiding principles that NAPSA had established for APS programs. Um, and these are often expressed in policy used by the state. Well, conversely, we discovered 69% of the programs have some ability to seek an emergency order to provide protective services. So that is kind of the other end of the spectrum. You want to be able to provide protection. And so you, the DAPS program is empowered uh, through that the type of emergency protective order that you can get to provide protective services. And they try to do that within the construct of providing uh, and protecting client rights at the same time. Next slide, please. Um, use of standardized tools. Uh, so we are, we are going to learn a lot more about use of standardized tools. Um, uh, the work that New Editions is doing for ACL is going to tell us a lot more about use of standardized tools uh, in terms of reliability and validity of tools. Uh, the work that we have done in crafting our survey on um, practice is going to tell us a lot more about standardized tools. For the moment, we have a pretty simple question that we ask in NAMERS, do you use a statewide tool? Most folks are thinking along the lines of using statewide tools in some sort of way. Next slide, please. So, in the context of the overall administration of APS, the first dependent variable that we come to has to do with the rate of reporting of allegations to adults across the states. Um, and so what you see here is the numerator is the, is, is the data that we get from the agency component in NAMERS on terms of the number of reports that are reported and the denominator is the population. Each bar in the chart um, shows that rate of reporting by state. And so when you look out at this, the thing that really jumps out at you is the huge range uh, that's rather here, particularly when you think about the outliers. Uh, when you look at that bar on the far right side and that bar on the far left side, you see there is a huge difference in what is reported to APS. That said, it should be noted that most states fall within the range of 10 to 20 reports per thousand. Uh, the outliers are significant and notable but there is a pretty good consensus falling in, in between the range of 10 to 20 reports. Um, if you took this data and you flipped it into a bell curve, it would actually come out pretty normal. And, and, and as we look at each of the dependent variables as we go through this, you will find that to be true. So the next thing that we did as part of the evaluation, next slide, um, was we, we tried to take the independent variables and, and and figure out what was the relationship with the dependent variables. Uh, where was there a relationship between all those independent variables that Zach ran through and the dependent variable? And we looked at that on a statistical level. Uh, and so in the first question we asked was with those independent variables, what is related to the rate of reporting? And so the thing that should be said is that for most of those independent variables, there was not a strong relationship between re reporting and many of those variables that we looked at. The one that we did find that there was a relationship um, was with worker ratio. Um, and so what you see here is that the 12 states that had the highest ratio of reports to workers also had the highest rate of reports per eligible adults in the population at 19.3 per thousand. 
And the 13 states with the lowest ratio of reports to workers have the lowest reports per eligible adult in the population at 10.2 per 1,000 adults. Next slide, please. I'm going to take a break here, and I'm, since this is the heavy statistics stuff, and since he's the dry academic professor, I'm going to let Zach explain latent class analysis to you. Happy to. Uh, so the one of the other approaches that we took to kind of looking at and thinking about the range of states and the various APS program structures that are out there was to try to group them together um, and really take an approach to see what programs are similar to other states um, and kind of what what different classifications of states can we see as we're trying to group different states together. So the way that we did that was called a latent class analysis. Um, I won't go into the, the heavy details of it, um, but suffice it to say, what latent class analysis does is take a, a, a group of variables, a group of characteristics that we put into the computer system. Um, we tell the computer that we want to characterize different states based on where they fall with regards to these characteristics. And the computer spits out these different groupings of states based on kind of looking at the range of characteristics that we that we fed into it. Um, so based on the characteristics that we thought were the key distinguishing characteristics between programs, these are the four groupings that our latent class analysis gave us. Um, when looking at these four different groups, it kind of stood out that the four, uh, the four characteristics at the top were the most common uh, things that defined uh, the states within each group, the most common commonalities. Um, so uh, the ones on the far left, the standard group, um, were kind of archetypal policies and practices, what we might expect from, uh, from a majority of APS programs. The second one is universal reporting. Uh, the most commonly shared characteristic between these states was that they had really broad mandatory reporting that encompassed all, all people, all citizens living in the state. The next one was the aging agency administered states. Um, so the most common characteristic here was that these states um, have their APS uh, within aging, uh, an agent, aging agency. And then on the far right, we had the county or local administered states. Uh, again, the most common characteristic amongst these states was that they were administered at the county or local level. This is all to say that um, not every state within each of these categories has that, that characteristic at the top, but it is the most kind of common characteristic that tied together all the different states in each of these buckets. These aren't, um, this is an evolving model. We'll be, we'll be working on refining it over time, but this is a, an important starting place. For us to think about how we can lump together the APS programs, which will help us think about um, maybe how we can look at APS programs, uh, the commonalities and the differences between them. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Carl. And so last week we were we were meeting with new ACL system enhancement grantees, and the conversation a couple of different times comes up. Uh, so who do we compare ourselves to? Or the question that we get most commonly with the APS TARC is, what about caseloads? What about caseloads? And our standard response is, caseloads are very complicated because of all of the difficult, because of all the diversity that we just discussed. Beginning to do the type of analysis that we're doing with the like class analysis helps us to kind of narrow those windows so that we can maybe do some comparisons across like programs and APS and do some things like benchmarking. Uh, I would just reiterate the last point that Zach made, which is that um, this will evolve. Hopefully it will improve when we add some variables with the practice survey. Um, maybe we can make it even more refined. With that said, let's go on to intakes. Next slide, please. Next two slides, I guess. Um, so let's talk about intake processes. We all understand what intake is in APS. It's the process of doing pre-screening um, before the investigation. So the first thing that we know from NAMERS data is we ask states the question about uh, do you have a statewide centralized model? Uh, do you 
do you have it at, do you collect data only at the local level or do you do it at both the state and the local level? You can see 53% of the states do it at the state level, 24% local, 22% at both. Next slide, please. Uh, next question is this issue of mandatory requirements in APS, and so 15 states have universal reporting. By universal reporting, we mean the statute says everybody has to report. Um, when statutes do specifically mention certain communities within the state, uh, medical and law enforcement are by far the most frequent mandated reporters in APS. There are a few states um, that have no or few mandatory reporting requirements. Um, and there are some states that go into great detail about who is a mandatory reporter, uh, with one state listing up to 13 different types of mandatory reporters in their state statute. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so who reports to APS? Uh, primarily professionals, um, followed by relatives. Uh, Self-reporting is a pretty low percent, and there's a number at 12% for other that did not fall into any of our categories. So professionals are the leading type of reporter to APS. Next slide, please. Um, so within NAMERS, um, one of the things that we ask is, as a result of the screening process, what percent do you, do you screen in? What, what process do you screen out? And so last year we had 1.7 million uh, total reports of which 800,000 roughly were accepted. So you can see that somewhere around 50%. And as you're about to see in a minute, the diversity on this one is incredible across the states. Next slide, please. And so that's what this particular slide shows. We get to the second dependent variable as part of our evaluation in which we look at the percent of reports accepted by APS. Um, and the range, once again, is really, really significant. Uh, and again, the outliers kind of jump out at you. Um, I think the most safe and simple conclusion that we can draw from this is that there is a lack of uniformity in practice in the ways that states accept and process intakes. Um, and so, this is obviously one area among many that it would be interesting to, to do a little bit more digging and exploring, and we'll get into some of that, I think, probably with our practice survey. Next slide, please. So we also tried to look at which of those independent variables had a strong relationship with that particular dependent variable related to intake and, and the, the maltreatment definitions um, and the eligibility policies in the state were strongly related uh, with the re with the reports with the percent of reports that we were that were accepted. Um, uh, and so, when we were looking at eligible populations, uh, you can see here that the that the higher percents were with those states that were with adults with disabilities and all elderly or with the states that were elderly uh, with or without disability vulnerability. Uh, and then in terms of the percent of accepted reports accepted by maltreatment definition, we broke it down into two, two variables. One was did the state have a what we called a comprehensive maltreatment definition, which meant they investigated lots of different types of maltreatment or a limited maltreatment definition. Uh, and you saw a pretty strong relationship between that and the rate of reports that were accepted. Not surprisingly, uh, the more comprehensive the definition, um, the, the broader percent of reports that were accepted. Next slide, please. So within our logic model framework that we came up with, you go from investigation, you go from intake to investigation. And so we've learned a number of things about um, investigation that we go. We asked the question in NAMERS, what preponderance, what standard of evidence do you use? And by far, uh, over half the states use preponderance of evidence. 
as their substantiation standard at 62%. Uh, none of the other standards comes very close to that. Um, next slide. Uh, we we tried to look at the question of who is the, within namers. We collect data on who is law who is the partner for APS. Law enforcement is is the most frequent partner um, for APS. Um, uh, and you also see licensing or other agencies as well as advocacy organizations. Um, but you can tell by looking at the N in this particular slide, uh, this is a good example of what Stephanie was talking about before. Um, not a lot of states actually collect data and reported data on this. Still, nonetheless, it's interesting to, to think that um, law enforcement and prosecutorial offices are our most frequent officers in APS based on a pretty limited sample. Next slide. Um, length of time for APS investigations. And so this is the, from the start of the investigation to the disposition is an average of 54.8 days. Uh, in NAMERS, we also look at the length of time for case initiation. Uh, that's from receiving the report to initiating the case. That's 2.3 days. Uh, we also look at total case duration, and that is about 70 days. The chart that you see here uh, shows that for the length of time for the investigation part of it, um, uh, it shows the, that it's pretty much typical bell curve with about 24% of the cases between 31 and 60 days. Um, very few cases that don't last very long and, and much fewer cases that last a really long time. Next slide, please. So uh, what about the question of recurrence? In, in NAMERS, we asked the question if a victim has had a previous report. And so you can see the numbers here at 45%. Not surprisingly, when you look at it by maltreatment type, you see that by far the most frequent uh, type of maltreatment with a repeat uh, for a particular victim was for clients with self-neglect, followed by exploitation and so forth, as you can see here. Um, the next thing that we looked at um, were, for what reason were APS cases closed? And so it basically falls down into, we did an APS investigation and closed the case, we did an APS investigation and we provided services. And so you can see that almost half of APS cases uh, involve some type of provision of services for the client to address the maltreatment. Uh, you see some cases were also closed because of client death or because that client was exhibiting rights of self-determination and APS did not follow through on the case. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the third dependent variable that we looked at then was substantiation rate. Um, and, and honestly, this is one where you would think there would be more consistency in this than you would see in something like the intake break. You would think substantiation is a little bit more defined um, in terms of process and in terms of the process outcomes that we look at, and indeed, um, it's it's just not there as much as we would be you would think that and again the range is fairly significant from substantiation rates that are very very low to substantiation rates that are very very high uh there's obviously a lot of factors that go into this um for example what percent of your clients or self-neglect is going to impact your substantiation rate if you're a state that doesn't do substant that doesn't do self-neglect it might be lower um, the conclusion again, though, is that there is a lot of definitional variation in policy and practice across APS. Um, if your state is high or low, it doesn't mean your practice is right or wrong, um, but it does mean that there is either some definitional or some sort of policy or practice uh, that means that you are different from the norm across the country. 
Um, again, this would be something that would be interesting to look at over time. And, and again, while the outliers really jump out, the vast majority of folks are in the middle on this one as well. And you can see that the that the average percent that is substantiated is at 35%. Um, in terms of the relationship between the independent variables and the attendant variables for um, investigation, states that have less stringent standards of evidence is associated with a higher percentage of reports that are substantiated. And so that one seems very, very self-evident and is what you would expect uh, when looking at APS. The final thing and final area that we want to look at is the area of post-investigation services. Um, and so what we, what we have found here is that um, almost all states uh, provide some type of post-investigation services. Um, nine states provide services to family members, and five states uh, actually provide services to a perpetrator. Uh, when we looked at the dependent variable here, uh, we have many less states that are able to provide us with detail on the services that they're able to provide. So you see the number of states here is much less. Um, and you still again get a pretty good range and the overall average is 33 um, percent um, and and the variation again is fairly significant next slide please and so when we think about the relationships here um, the shorter the maximum response time in an investigation that's required by policy and the shorter the investigation completion time that states exhibit uh, and the use of a standardized assessment tool are all associated with a higher percentage of victims receiving services. Um, perhaps that is consistent with um, the idea that the more quickly, the more responsive state APS programs are, uh, uh, the better investigations they do, and perhaps that results in a higher substantiation or, or need for services rate. Again, probably something to dig a little bit more on and think about some more. Quality assurance uh, is the last area in our framework, and we collected some quality assurance information through our policy profiles that we did. Um, states that require a case record according to policy are 39 states. Uh, that's the 39 that we were able to establish with the, with the extent policy materials that we looked at. Other states may require it too. Um, states that require a supervisor have a role in reviewing and approving cases is 36. So um, most APS programs are requiring documentation and requiring supervisor approval. Uh, we also asked a more general question of is there anything else in terms of quality assurance that the state is maybe doing and 25 states um, had a variety of different actors that would kind of fall in this other category. Um, we are well aware from an APS TARP perspective that this is an area that um, states across the country are interested in learning more about and so we plan on doing some work on it later in the year. Um, next slide. So here's some of what we think it means. Um, there's a lack of consistency across states in definitions and key decision-making processes in APS. I think we sort of all intuitively knew that, um, but we're not, and so we are not too surprised when, when the evaluation work that we have done reflects this. Uh, it points to the fact that the guidelines uh, that ACL has been pursuing will probably, hopefully, help move states to a place of, of, of best practices and more consistency across time. Uh, just the mere fact of measuring some of this stuff and understanding and knowing where your state is in relation to another state, hopefully over time, will help us to figure out how to get to a more consistent place as well. Um, 
I think it's also important that we continue to improve the quality of the data that's available for evaluation and analysis. Uh, we've now collected NAMER's data for three years. We're in the process of collecting the fourth year. Um, one of the things that we're doing with ACL this year is starting to look at data quality, looking at data completeness, um, and trying to figure out what the next steps are, what the right strategies are. Um, for improving data quality because the better our data, the better our analysis, and the better the improvements that state APS programs will be able to make. Um, and so we're going to continue our efforts to improve our data collection and submission. Um, one of the things that we hope to do is to move to start doing more state-specific analysis using the NAMERS data um, that will help us to get to those places of consistency. Uh, across APS in terms of the data quality, but also in terms of figuring out what the best practices are and states can improve their programs. Um, and then we're using the data to help us target areas that we want to work on from a TA perspective. And one of those areas would be quality assurance, as I mentioned just a second ago. And so what do you think, um, Andy, what do you think? Do we need to, to do we have any questions at this point? Uh, I know we're running out of time here in a hurry. We do, yeah. We are running out of time. We might go a little bit over, so hopefully if folks can stay <clears throat> excuse me, on the line uh, for a few minutes past our time, in time of 4 o'clock. So we do have a few questions. Um, I will dive right into those. Uh, the first one is, when and where is this data going to be available? Uh, the, it's not a simple answer to that. Uh, we, we are still working on the publication of the evaluation data. That data has not been published yet. The NAMERS data for 2018, the report was just released. Um, and so that's the short answer to that, given that we're short on time. And while you are answering questions, I will put the link in the chat box so everybody can download that report. So hang on for a little bit and you'll see that. Yep, mm -hmm. acl.gov, but I'll give you the specific link to download a PDF copy of it. Um, okay, so here's another question. Is the submission to namers of just one per state, does that result in an unbalanced picture? And by that, they mean, are there because there are certain states or even metro areas that are larger than some states are. So again, let me repeat uh, that. If the submission to namers <laughs> of just one per state, uh, does that provide an unbalanced picture because some states and metros have such a large population? I'm not sure I'm following the connection between the first and the second part of the question, but let me let me take a stab at that. So one one question is uh, one submission per state. Um, so you end up with some very diverse states which have different types of APS programs for different types of populations and, and we're forcing them to submit one. And so does that kind of provide a distorted picture? Um, the answer to that's complicated, I think, from a statistical perspective. Um, and, and in terms of the question of whether in the second half of the question, you know, you're, you're always going to have small states and large states. Um, one of the things that I think we hope to do in the long run um, is to move to doing some case level analysis and not state level analysis when looking at some of these questions related to APS. Um, because when you're looking at states, obviously you have a huge range. Um, in terms of the impact that some states will have versus other states. And so we want to get to where we're looking at at, at all of the cases together across the states and, and the level of analysis is not the state, it's the system as a whole. At the same time, we recognize that it's information on states that helps states to improve. Um, so we're trying to find that right balance there. Zach, do you have exactly. any feelings on the statistical perspective? Before Zach I just, goes, I want yeah, go ahead. I just want I'm sorry. I just wanted to to reiterate from a um a big perspective, not the statistical perspective which Zach will provide, but we are aware of the challenges in terms of not 
not the whole state. Sometimes you might only have the large urban area report. And that's why we are very um, cautious in the type of data analysis that we do and that mm -hmm. we that we um so we are very cognizant of that uh challenge and then Zach, do you want to handle the statistical conversation <laughs> i won't get too into the weeds but i will just say that um, we've been very cognizant uh, throughout the evaluation process to choose a level of analysis that is um, appropriate to the question being asked so for some questions we are doing analyses at the state level, um, wherein every state um, is treated as equal. Uh, so for example, in counting the number of states that have certain policies or procedures. For other analyses, we are really interested in the client or the victim level. And for those, we are using um, the, sure. the client slash victim level data uh, to really ensure that, you know, we're not necessarily um, giving additional weight to smaller states or bigger states, but we are treating every victim as an individual and as, as a unit of one um, as we're mm -hmm. looking at the analyses. And, you know, Zach, that, oh, goes, so. uh, that goes into our next question pretty well, because this the next question was, the rate of reports graph, the denominator stated per 1,000 eligible adults. And the question is, is, was this denominator selected based on the types of populations the state serves? Let me know if you'd like me to repeat that. In a word, yes. Uh, so, so we have those customized to the state based on their individual um, eligibility uh, practices and those eligibility policies. Great. Um, let's see. Another question is, if I understand this correctly, how many state-sponsored APS agencies use the same data system for consistency? Again, how many state-sponsored APS agencies use the same data system, I guess, across the entire state? Do we have any data on that? So is it how many across the country are using the same, or how many within a state are using the same system? I believe it's within a state are using the same system. Most. How's that? Yeah, I would concur uh, with that, too. There's a few... Yeah, there's a few that we know that use different systems. Um, I believe California uses a few different systems across the counties. But yeah, I agree with what you're saying, Carl. And, and, and I think one of the things that we've seen with NAMERS is that uh, it has encouraged, and, and the ACL grants have incentivized states to move to having the same system across the state. So while it's not 100% across the country, I think most do. Yeah. And then I think I'll share a couple comments, and then I think we'll have to wrap up for the day because we're a few minutes over. But one comment was, um, what surprised me the most was the diversity of results across the board. And I think that's definitely um, surprising to a lot of people is the diversity of the programs are reflected in the results so much. And then another comment was for Wisconsin, um, there is... Uh, at least it severely underreports elder abuse on tribal lands um, where we are county based and counties get state funds. They have 11 tribes that do not get funding. So that was another comment just to take into um, account some of the, the tribal entities that may or may not be reflected here. Um, all right. I think with that, if there's no further uh, comments from our speakers, uh, going once, going twice. I think we will wrap things up. Um, if we can go to the very last slide of the slide deck, um, there'll be some contact information on here, right here. They contact us. You can reach out to us via the APS TARC website, and you have the web address right there. Um, there's also an email address, APSTARC-TA at acl.hhs.gov. There were several folks that asked about the slides for today's uh, webinar. You can download those under the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. You just click on the hyperlink that says slides, but you can also reach out to us. We'd be happy to send those to you as well. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all the questions that were asked, but we'll relay those to our speakers and maybe they can get back to you on some of that. Um, thanks everybody for your attention. Oh, also this is recorded, as I said earlier, and we will let everybody know when this is posted online so that you can review the entire recording. Thanks so much to our speakers, to Stephanie, Carl, and Zach for giving us all of this great information today, and I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Take care.